Welcome to Co-Opinions. My name is Josh, and today I have Brent with me. You. So today we are going to go back to a more traditional format, talk about a few different things, and I think the topics we'll be covering today are games that we came to significantly late, and also games that have changed the gameplay style as the series has progressed. However, Brent also had a micro topic yep. of something involving Black Panther. Yeah, well, it's in my yeah, my series of movie video game things. Movie video game jibbity jabs. But before we do that, first let's talk about the things we've played. We beat Snipper Clips. We did beat Snipper Clips. That game was super fun, even though I wanted to crucify you at yeah. time. Only Mike really, should put an applause in here for us. He I, won't because I asked for it now. So I really hope he does because we tried really hard. I hope he does like the single clap. The golf clap. Yeah, that'd make me happy. That game was very... De- it was really only the last level that was particularly rough. Yeah, it was. And that's why I've actually suggested that we not jump right back into those <laughs> bonus levels. Because I'm pretty sure the bonus levels are just harder versions of what we've already played. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Anyways, besides that, what else have you played? Oh, I've been tackling Assassin's Creed Origins pretty hard. It's been enjoyable because I too have been playing Assassin. Tell me what your current thoughts are on it. I mean, I enjoy it. Being as it's the topic that spawned the main one for today. Yes. uh, It is quite different from, I mean, still got that same Assassin's Creed feel, but... The gameplay is definitely drastically altered from previous iterations. Uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. I mean, it's it. there was definitely a learning curve, and I may have said that last time. I don't remember. There is a learning curve, so I is, do enjoy it, first and foremost. However, I have described it multiple times as Horizon Zero Dawn, but not as good. That is not a dig at Assassin's Creed, it's just Horizon Zero Dawn was very good. And a lot of the times, the first off, I have still encountered my fair share of bugs. Only one game breaking, but I remember one that I thought was hilarious, is you can come up to cage big cats, and one of the lions, it its torso stayed in the same place, but its feet, all four of them, kept shifting from one side to the other so it would kept like rotating underneath it it's kind of terrifying well what was more terrifying is i would this isn't a spoiler there's a mission where you have to find two people who have been cutting up bodies and feeding them to alligators yeah i think i've done that one already yeah well it was part of the lizard oh yeah yeah Yeah. uh so they're both on boats i found the first guy no problem the second guy it showed him in a really weird location When I came to his location, there was the boat sticking straight up in the air, spinning around, (laughs) and then the guy just kind of fell off of it. That's funny. Um, Yeah. One of the few glitches that I've run into was I went to, I don't remember if this is one of the main mission ones, you go into the embalming area, and you know those little things that go, animal attack is happening, save civilian, Mm -hmm. one of those exclamation points. I go, and I have to do the talking but I can't get up close to one guy because apparently an alligator has spawned in the bricks below it. Great. So every time I walk up to him, it instantly goes off. And I also, I also, when you have to free a rebel from, he, oh yeah, from captivity, right? I I don't know what happened. I stealth murdered everybody in the caravan. Super proud of that. But the first time I did it, it said I. I killed the last one right when the other rebels came out to save him, and it triggered the conflict flag, but it didn't go away, Ooh. so I couldn't talk to him. Oh, that sucks. Yes. And then one time, this was the worst one, I was in a tomb, and I was right at the end, and I tried to run over some treasure, and I got stuck on the treasure, and I kept trying to climb up, but then I fell down and tried to climb. I couldn't get out of it. I had to restart. Awful. Awful. But it's nowhere near as terrible as Unity. That set the all-time, all-time bar for the worst. Yes. But other than that, Brent, did you have any other games? Uh, no, not, not lately. So I wrapped up Superstar Saga because I've been juggling Superstar Saga and Assassin's Creed Origins. And I only had to activate Scrub Mode once because in the last dungeon, it's like a 15-year-old game at this point, so no spoilers. You have to fight all the Koopalings. And one of them has the ability to 
create five fake copies of themselves and then they try to shuffle them around and you have to beat them in seven turns. I couldn't keep track of them when there were six of them. It was a very tiny screen and they move very fast. So I don't feel particularly bad, but I had to turn on easy mode so I could burn them down. I beat the final boss without easy mode, but that one boss I had to do it. So it happens. I'll be wrapping up the side content for for Superstar Saga before too long because I'm sure I'll get up to a point in Assassin's Creed Origin where I go, I think I'm done with this for right now. And then I'll just put it down and pick up Superstar Saga and it'll be a good time. Moving on, let's talk about some of the news that's come up recently. I have a few things. Brent, I know you have a few things. Why don't you go first? Um, Apparently there was a leaked... Release date. Uh, release date for the Spider-Man game, uh, apparently sometime in September, like September 29th, I believe. Mm-hmm. Some Swish site may have leaked that. Bungie is uh, tackling the uh, rewarding with the latest update to Destiny 2. They want so much to... F- I, people are so upset about Destiny 2. Well, what I've heard is nobody's super happy because we have a handful of friends who play, some who have been on the show before, and... I can you we can use his name because he's been on this show multiple times. Mark, has you got his feedback from this? Um, yeah, he wasn't happy once some of the yeah stuff started happening. I know uh, Mike, who has also been on the show several times, saying our not editor. Happy. our editor, our editor, he's not happy about it. So it's whatever. We'll see. Let's see how it plays out. Dragon Ball Fighters, since you refused, for, yeah, z- whatever. Mm-hmm. It, it's getting pretty good reviews. It is getting very solid reviews. Are you going to end up picking that up? I might. I'm intrigued. Before we get to the last bit of significant news, I would also like to focus, bring up that God of War, the new one for PS4 where you fight Norse gods, mm-hmm. is coming out on April 20th. Oh, that's sooner than I thought. I'm was. excited, because especially since they said that thing I would mentioned years ago where they need to go to other mythologies and kill like Egyptian gods and Incan gods and Middle American gods. Like, yeah, I think we're not going to let God of War stagnate as much as we did last time. There's tons of gods to kill. There's so many pantheons. I'm saying that right, correct? Pantheon. I always mess that up. Let's talk about this last bit of news before we get into your micro topic. And that bit of news is the Nintendo Labo. I'm calling it Labo. I'm saying Labo. Okay. And it is what, Brent? It's making accessories out of cardboard? Yes. I want to see how this works. So the idea behind it is you get guided kits to create different accessories for your Nintendo Switch out of cardboard. Now, they're supposed to interact with different bits of software in ways that are truly unique. So you're supposed to scan them? I don't know. I'm so confused by this. I'll be frank. I haven't looked up anything about them. I, I'm not trying to be judgmental about it. I will like to see how well it does. I don't know if it's for me. Well, you're uh, a man child. Uh, nice. Uh, <laughs> you can't recover from that I line. can't. You, you, killed, you killed my motivation. Okay. And it, actually, yeah, I'll recover from it. My point is, like, I would have loved to have been in the... The meeting where someone's like, guys, guys, remember all the plastic accessories we made for the Wiimote? What if we do it with cardboard? And everyone's like, you're a genius. Well, the thing that gets me about that is how many hours until they're like, hey, if you don't want the cardboard ones, here's the Mad Cat's plastic ones. <laughs> right? Right? Mm-hmm. Oh, God, yeah. It's it's going to be a thing. It's going to be a thing sooner rather than later. I'm curious to see how it pans out. It's a bold strategy. I I did really like that one meme in that article I sent you where it was Miyamoto. It has him and it's uh, what did it's the uh, some rapper Drake meme. Drake meme, yeah. And uh, you know, no loot boxes, no cardboard boxes. Yes. I feel like someone at I feel like someone at uh, Nintendo was like, "You've seen what Solid Snake can do with a cardboard box. We can do so much more." I'm positive that's how it went. I think you did legit break the code. But anything else on that? No, I've got it. Okay. So why don't you go into your Black Panther micro oh, right. thing? So I remember last year when Spider-Man came out, we did the Spider-Man topic. We did. Where we talked about some Spider-Man uh, games. whatever a spider can. Good episode. <laughs> and I tended to touch more games. We, I do count, and I don't believe I said it during that episode, I do count the Arkham game as being the one I wanted to do for Justice League. 
Mm-hmm. And I do believe I said the Rogue Squadron one was for the next Star Wars movie. We should have done Thor. We could have. We could have talked briefly about the Thor game by Sega. Singular, right? Yeah, no, it was for the. They only made games for the first phase one movies. Yeah, right. They didn't even make an Avengers game. They canned it. So, hmm. uh, but this was hard to find because Black Panther's not a character that's had a whole lot of games. And there are two games he was in. I'm kind of saving them for Avengers three when it comes out. Okay. I did look up. He did. You know, Black Panther was in. Ultimate Disney Alliance. Infinity. Oh, Disney Infinity. He wasn't in Ultimate Alliance? That's the one I was saving for. Sorry. Yeah. Well, he's in those, but I plan to talk about him because that's usually almost the entire Avengers roster. Yeah, right. Um, He was in Disney Infinity. He's in a lot of those Lego Marvel games that came out a few years ago. Ah, uh, yes. The definitive Marvel games. Yes. The definitive Lego. Nothing's, nothing's definitive until it's Lego. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really all you can talk because he's not a character like many of these movie characters hasn't had a whole lot of video games made up because he's not Spider-Man or the X-Men. Yeah. You got to have some draw. You got to, you have to have like a morning cartoon. Is he, what used to be. He the did qualifier. have a morning cartoon briefly in the nineties on really? BET. Yes, it was one season. But you yes. say on BET? Yes. And this was the Black Panther comic book character. Are you yes. sure? All right. Yeah. Yes. That. Hmm. I will. I will show you when the podcast is done. I. That sounds like a joke. You understand my I know. confusion? Uh, yeah, there. but it's okay. not. It's not. All right. Um. No, there are other movies I wish we would have done it with. And we're talking about it because. Like Jumanji. We could have done one for Jumanji. There was a game. There, yeah, you had a boy. Anyways, what else about Black Panther? Oh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, like I said, that's it because there isn't a whole lot he's been in besides games I was saving for another movie. Okay. I just well, wanted to briefly touch on it to keep my topic series going. Okay. Well, half gold star, you, an attempt was made. I made an attempt and that's what I appreciate. Moving on to our smaller topic <laughs> of, the, of the evening. That was going to be Games that we came significantly late to the party on. Now, I'm going to throw an example out for me. There's some smaller versions. Like, did you hear about the game Okamaden? I heard of it. Do you know what happened? What? Okami is the one that originally came out on PS2. It was later ported to Wii, PS3, and PS4, and PC, I believe. That's the one where it's basically you play Zelda as a mythical wolf. Okay. It's awesome. Oh, yeah, now I know what you're talking about. Now, Okama Den is the sequel that came out on the DS. I'm not... I only give this honorable mention because I played the original and it took me years to play the sequel. The reason it took so long was the sequel was not very good. And I wanted it to be better than it was, and it wasn't. I was say, it feels like if the sequel was a straight-up handheld sequel. Yeah, expectations yeah. are low. But what are some examples for you, Brian? Um, some of the ones that I could think of. The Mass Effect trilogy comes now, to mind. Now, what striking gentleman got you those games? You did. It was a birthday <gasps> present. Yes. But and I beat it didn't them. take you years to beat them? There's one game. One game that's taken me years to beat. Okay, but how long did it take you to play these once you acquired them? Well, only a few months. Okay. I had to beat. I had, a, I had all three of them beat within the next year. But you didn't start I them. Destroyed I destroyed my PS3 playing them. There you go. Now I feel loved. <laughs> So, did you intentionally wait so long, or did you even want these? Did I? Well, they were at the time they were all on Xbox. Oh, and you were not an Xbox dude. So, but then when the, but when they got the trilogy port to the PS3, Mm -hmm. so and I'm guessing it was worth the wait. Yeah, I enjoyed them, and especially because they did. You know, most of all the DLC stuff was in that trilogy, so I didn't have to pay for it extra. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, yeah, there was a lot of that stuff in it. Did you get to Mass Effect 3 controversy well after it was a yes. controversy? Okay. So you don't even know how it was original? I know. Yeah, I know because Mark had showed me. Got it. When he first beat it. Um, and so I knew how it originally ended. So I knew what the difference was. And what are some other series? Um, I believe we talked Half-Life. I mean, I played the first one at some point. Yeah, but we played it for like... If you were anything I like never me, beat it, so... Well, we rented it. Like, I was at a buddy's house, and we rented it. We're like, oh, yeah, it's a mature-rated game. Violence, violence, hooray. Got through, like, the first two levels. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, through Black Mesa is where I played through. So, mm-hmm. um, I would say... Uh, 
Yeah, Orange Box when I came into Half Life Two because I got that in 2011. So yeah, that was before. that was one of the first things I got for my Xbox 360. Yeah, even though it was kind of hard to find, wasn't it? Uh, I don't think it was. I think I got it pretty easily hmm. at the time. So both Half Life and Portal. Yeah, guys, you came in way late to Portal. I think yeah, Portal Two might have been out at yeah, that it was point. out at that point. <laughs> yeah. God, that was an awkward con- You're like, man, I love this Portal game. I'm like, just wait till you play the sequel, you weirdo. <laughs> I know there are other games. That Did I've it come- feel weird playing Portal and getting all those jokes about it years later? Like, yeah. the cake is a lie. And, yeah. Okay. I've always kind of wondered. Because those games that have become popular since... Um, Internet memes have been much more prolific. So there's so many, like the took an arrow to an, to the knee. Imagine if you were out of the loop and you're like, took an arrow to the knee. I don't like, I understand a dude got shot in the knee, but then you played Skyrim years later. You're like that. That's the guy. That's the guy right there. <laughs> oh, close. Pokemon go. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to give you that. Uh, I mean, it has been a while. And are you playing it right now? No, I'm actually looking through my game list to find more games that I came to. Okay. So you should hit your your list. Okay. One of them I'm pretty sure I came late to. And there was only one game, so I'm not 100% sure. This is in my honorable mention category. Is Enslaved Odyssey to the West. Now, some people we know have talked it up quite a bit. It is basically a video, newer video game adaptation of the game Journey to the game of the story Journey to the West. In this one, you play as a guy. I think he's even called Monkey. I could be wrong though. And you have an extendable uh, mechanical pole, and the idea is it's just a updated telling of this story where the Monkey Prince escorted the princess across the world and da 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 to achieve enlightenment yada yada it was a really good game really strong game it had a unique approach to post-apocalyptic worlds which uh, i kind of want to talk about that in a podcast is different ways games approach post-apocalypticism that would be a fun one to do right and this one it was bright it was colorful it had great voice acting I don't know why it failed to make it. It was by Ninja Theory, for God's sakes. They make quality stuff. So I'm not sure why it failed to take off. And it's more confusing when you play a game that you're really late to. Like a game you pick up years later. Because you're like, I always meant to get to that. And it's $5, so why not? And then you pick it up and you beat it. You're like, why did this not get more popular? This game was awesome. Enslaved was one of those games to me. And I'm going to put this one in there. This is still on my honorable mention list, but I know that some of our collaborators will appreciate it. On PlayStation Network, they often have sales. There's a sale going on right now. And there are frequently sales for the Sukaden games. They are old PlayStation RPGs. Consistently, some quoted as some of the best. I was given $5 by... uh, Frequent contributor, Nick Krause, he said, (laughs) buy the first two. I'm like, yeah, but I don't know when I'll get to them. He's like, here's the money, buy them. Because at some point you'll play them and you'll love them. So I'm like, you know what? I'll give them a shot. So last year, yeah, at the beginning of last year, I got through the first Sukaden game and it was shockingly good. Now, downside, you can't get the perfect ending unless you save everybody, like recruit everybody. And there are missable characters. That's yeah. bogus. Yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so that I'm curious if that's an issue in the second one because in order to make sure I didn't miss any characters, I had to find a character guide, and that had huge spoilers. Huge spoilers. Because they're like, oh, and by the way, I guess Sukaden spoilers. If for some reason you haven't played this and still want to, pew pew. They go, if you don't recruit everybody, you don't get to resurrect this guy. What do you mean, resurrect? (laughs) Yeah, so I found out a main character died. Yeah. Uh, That's not the best. No, it's not. 
But the first game was really good, and I fully intend to get to the second game. And actually, with some of my current backlog winding down, I intend to get to it. But I have actual games on this list now. So you have anything else? I did come... Resident Evil 5, I think. I came pretty late to the party on that one. I'll give you... Well, that's another one of those big Binder-O games. Yeah, but I played that separately. Yeah, you hated it. Yeah. I like the (laughs) challenge levels, though. Challenge stuff is fun. I wonder how you would have enjoyed it had you played it cooperatively. Maybe a little better than I did. I loved it. Because me and my roommate at the time, we played the death out of it. I think I looked it up. The last time I played through it, you want to guess how many hours I put into that game? Probably well over 100. No, not that extensive. Still 50. Okay. Can you imagine 50 hours into that game? That's a lot of hours into that game. That is a lot. I am. I think I may have beaten that game in the double digits. I We loved that game. Anyways. Um rare replay collection is a bunch of games i never played that was well some of those well over a decade later yeah um, uh jeff horse gemini i mean i did play you it played it but you didn't i didn't beat it until uh perfect dark mm-hmm. i mean that was definitely the first time i played perfect dark and banjo kazooie it's the first time i beat that um another one that comes to mind is pokemon snap <laughs> really i think i briefly played it at someone else's house but i you know that that time you watched me beat it was the first time I ever beat that game. Pokemon Snap, excuse the pun, but is a snappy enough game that I think I've beaten that five or six times. You can beat it in a second. Oh, yeah. No, we beat it in, what, that was a night or two? Yeah, we beat it in a night because it's super fun. It the is super best. Fun. Anyways, do you have any other game series? No, those were the big ones that came to mind. Because we're going to circle back to the overall arcing theme here. Once I finish my series is up. Okay. Because I'm going to tie this together. This isn't us just saying, oh, yeah, I played that two years later. <laughs> no, this is going somewhere. <laughs> you like that? So the two significant series that I got into very, very late and very significantly got into was the Shantae series. So the Shantae and the Pirate, there are currently four Shantae games. The first one came out on Game Boy Color near the tail end of its life cycle. The second one was released, initially it was planned to be released episodically on DSiWare, but they decided just to release it as the full game on DSiWare, Shantae Risky's Revenge. The third game was released on... Yes, the third game was released on Wii U, PS4, and Xbox... One, I believe. And that was Shantae and the Pirate's Curse. And Pirate's Curse was where I officially got into this series because I bought a Nintendo hum- Humble Bundle and it was in there. Like, well, this seems like it could be fun. And I have no idea how old the game was at that point. But I enjoyed it enough that I went back and I played the earlier ones. I didn't beat the first one because uh, it had some very questionable design decisions. The game was segmented into an open world, but you had lives. That doesn't make any sense to you either, right? No. Yeah, I couldn't make heads or tails of that design decision. But it might have been a limitation of the hardware. I truthfully don't know. Maybe? I don't know. It's weird. But I also then picked up Shantae and the Shantae Half Genie Hero when it came out. It was a game that was kickstarted and somewhat recently released. I picked it up on the Switch, I believe. Because it had some mild improvements. I enjoyed it tremendously. It's not, it, it does nothing to change the world, but if you like solid platformers with good soundtracks and bright visuals, it's decent. The last most significant series is, you're never gonna believe this, is the Phoenix Wright series. I feel like I did know that you came to that late, but. Now, do you remember why I came to it late? <sighs> I don't, not at this point. Okay. So, uh, back in 2010, I believe, they announced there was going to be a Phoenix Wright, right, Professor Layton go. crossover. Like, oh my god, I love Professor Layton. I'm going to pick this up in a heartbeat. And like, But I've never played a Phoenix Wright game. <laughs> hmm. I should probably play those. So, 
uh, Kraus, Nick, he goes, I'm going to buy you the first three games as a present because it, your birthday's coming up or something. Like, great. So I started them up and I'm like, wow, these are actually awesome. I crushed through the first one. And then I started up the second one. I'm like, wow, this one's garbage. The second one is not good. Yeah, I think you've said Yeah. Well, I've said it. Nick has said it because he started playing it. And I gave it a little time and I started up the third one. I'm like, okay, the second one was an outlier. These games aren't consistently good. And then they still hadn't said the Phoenix Wright and Professor Layton crossover was coming to America yet. They hadn't even given it a release date in Japan yet. And I'm like, okay, well, I really like these three games, but they haven't put out a fifth game because there was a fourth one where you had a different protagonist. Like, I don't really want to play that one because you're not playing as the guy I love. And there's really no reason to play it because it's not like it's going to tie in. Like, well, guess again, because we're making a Phoenix Wright 5. Is that crossover coming out ever? <laughs> So I played the fourth game. I then the fifth game came out and I ble- beat that. And then a year later they brought the Phoenix Wright Professor Layton crossover. I beat five Phoenix Wright games from the time they announced it to the time <laughs> they brought it to America. Wow. How insane is that? But it feels on par. (laughs) Yeah, because God knows there's right now three Phoenix Wright games they haven't translated. But I love this series. It has become an enormous institution for me. And I really wish I could get more people to play it. But it is, as some people are very against this term I have come to learn out, it's more or less a visual novel. But you (laughs) have to, yeah, right. You have to use some degree of logic to progress through the visual novel. But once you know the beats, just immediately down. So how I'm tying this together, Brent, is what unified why we didn't come to these games so late? Was it accessibility? Was it our tastes changed? Because I know looking at this series, about half of these are things I wanted to play, but I never found time to. About half of these are... Other people suggested it, and I put it off for a long time. And some of these are games that I just took a chance out of the blue. Why Why are these games that you didn't get to? I mean, the first two definitely were the accessibility thing because of the Xbox 360 and not having one at the time, mm-hmm. especially for Mass Effect and then the Orange Box. Evil was definitely a, me giving something a chance. Um, that was the one you gave a chance? You knew my, you knew my opinion going in. Yeah. Continue. Um, the other ones are just, uh, I put them off and I never got to them when the 64 came out just because of the way I played games back then. So, And then I finally had a way to play them now. So I did it. Well, does this change how you view games? Does this increase your desire to go back and play games that you may have put off? or Or does this try to make you grab games in the moment more? Because I mean, I'm definitely ma- pushing more to try and play a lot of games that I haven't played older games that I've missed out on. I mean, that's something I'm trying to do right now. And do you think that those games were influenced by these? Did, were yeah. these such rousing successes that you're like, I should go back and give this a shot? I definitely think um, Rare Replay probably roused some nostalgia and mm-hmm. want to do it. Um, I know I could probably uh, point to the amount of GameCube games that I regret not playing back when the game GameCube was, you know, in its heyday. Well, I know that you are particularly excited about the Wii U is supposed to be bringing GameCube games to the virtual <laughs> console. I know uh, you're pretty excited about that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did you mean Wii U? Yes. Like, okay. Oh, I said that okay. perfectly. Okay. Because uh, how bad were you banking on oh, that? Yeah. I was like I've told several people, if the Switch doesn't have it within the next year, I'm going to the V stock and buying that. <laughs> and just getting it over with and playing them on my GameCube because that is a system you could literally throw off a five story building and it will still work. And would that be a good thing or a bad thing? I mean it's built to built to work. It's solid. Uh, like not- the rest. But uh yeah, there's definitely a lot of games I want to get to that and a lot of games I try to open up to, so. Well, I'm glad to see that those had a positive impact on you. It's something that I uh, 
I've tried to be more open to. At the same time, I've also tried to moderate how I approach these. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But now for our big topic of the evening. Games that have changed the way they played as the series has progressed. Now, Brent, I'm going to let you take point on this one because you actually came up with this idea. So why don't you tell us where this idea came from? Um, so it came from starting up Assassin's Creed Origin and the just draft. <laughs> yeah, drastic difference because it, you know, it went from the action adventure game that was Assassin's Creed to a much more RPG style. I know you fronted MMO. So I have described it as a streamlined single player portion of an MMO because it calls out where the quests are. It, it, it's very MMO-y, but you haven't really played any MMOs. I have not. So I think you, had you done that, played World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy 14 or 11, you would relate this significantly. But what were some of the additional aspects how did it used to play before Origins, and how's it play well, I mean, uh, the, uh, the The combat system has definitely changed from the streamlined... Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it was streamlined. Well, the original? The original. Well, the quick kills and stuff like that, to now you... It's a lot... You have a lot more control over the fighting, per mm-hmm. se. You're actually really com- doing the combat with your enemies. They added... You're upgrading weapons and armor. I don't remember ever doing that in a previous game. Uh, at least so not to the extent that you do in this no, one. No, you just bought new weapons yeah. previously. Now you have to collect... Now you have to collect... Materials. Um, materials, which Pretty. is very rudimentary. Like, I'm yeah. not gonna... I'm not trying to dig on it because of that. But each material has three different versions, if even. Yeah. There's three different kinds of... Three different kinds of building material. You have wood, copper, iron. You have three different kinds of skin. Yeah. Soft leather, hard leather, and pelt. And that might be it. I think so. (laughs) The entire game is the... Oh, no. You also have very... You have the carbon crystals. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those are for the high-end upgrades. But um, you, you have to go to a blacksmith to get them to upgrade the weapons if you want them to and then you can craft your own stuff for your own armor Mm -hmm. your hand gauntlets your hidden blade everything like that along with uh you have a skill chart i think there was some kind of small skill chart in syndicate maybe there were skills that you could upgrade like there there was a skill chart but it felt I guess it really wasn't different, but for some reason this feels different. Yeah, this really feels different, and I don't know why. I think it feels a lot more like an RPG than any of the previous games ever did. Well, and you level. Did you mention that? Oh, yes, you level up. That's a very important distinction. And the way you do that, that goes with the whole... You get the quests to get the experience, and... The quests can take you to new areas, and it feels very MMO because it uses a lot of the tricks MMOs use, including but not limited to vast, open, empty areas. Yeah, there's a lot of area. Some of those are like, why do these exist? uh, The deserts and the seas in particular. Yeah. Now, what do you think benefited from these changes for this series? I mean, I I think doing this keeps it fresh in some regard. Um, it gives it a new feel. You don't feel like it's getting stale the whole time. I mean, there yeah, there are things from previous Assassin's Creed games I wish were in there. I know I I was, as I was explaining to someone who played it, who, a friend of mine, we were talking about the eagle thing. Because, yeah, there are times where I wish you still had eagle vision. I won't lie. I kind of like the new way better, if we're being honest. When I'm hunting for stuff, like, on ground, I would, I would rather have eagle vision than the pulse. So my big problem with the eagle, vi- the new eagle vision, more than anything, is it doesn't stop time. That's my big thing. Is that if I'm going somewhere on a camel, and I really want to, if I'm going somewhere on a camel, and I really want to find the thing I'm hunting for, it just keeps moving while. Well, have you zoomed in? 
I guess that does freeze it. It slows it? it, but yeah, it's, it makes it really move really slow. But, well, and I was as I was explaining to someone, the reason I kind of don't have a problem with like putting the eel up into the air. I'm talking more about when you're on the ground and you it does the smaller pulse when you just press the button. I almost for a never use that, but go ahead. But it reminds me a lot of using the dog in MGS5. I I feel like it's more effective. Yeah, well, because the dog isn't up in the air. And yeah, and the dog and the eagle can't be damaged. Yeah, so valid. I I think these changes were ultimately not only beneficial but required. If we're gonna be honest, they kind of acknowledged after Syndicate that they had to retool because yeah. while Syndicate was a perfectly serviceable game, Unity. I'm I'm gonna use hyperbole here. Unity damn near destroyed their brand. I don't think it was damn near. It did, it did a damage. lot of damage. It, it did. did so much damage that even though they said that they admitted that Syndicate had really really slow sales compared to Unity. Yeah. They said that it made up after the first week, but I kind of feel like that was a PR stunt. If not, like they can't say, oh god, this didn't sell at all. And the fact they took what two years to put this out after Syndicate, and it well, and I think that goes to that goes to a whole different point about needing to space out games instead of yearly releases. Yeah, and but man, we've went over this before with the whole different studios and yada yada yada. Yeah, and um, but yeah, the, this was the one that that triggered this because it it was just a drastic change from the entire franchise overall, and that's saying something because I mean three loosely introduced naval combat that then became a thing of the series for several games and and <sighs> this game tries to do it still but there's a difference between the time periods when you're trying to use vessels back in an age where naval combat was slamming the front of your boat into another I have, boat i have noticed that is by far the most effective way oh to yeah buy. and it kind of feels like those those are kind of the places where i feel that the game uh, doesn't make enough progress. Like, I feel like they're trying to still acknowledge things that people used to like, but didn't, don't really currently work. Like, the naval stuff worked great in 4. It worked good in 3. They need to well, let it go. It still worked great in Rogue, too. It did work great in Rogue, and when that but game it was also gets... The, but again, that goes back to the Assassin's Creed is a game about over time periods, and that's a time period where it works. This is a time period where it doesn't. Yeah, they sure tried, though. So, what... Is there anything else about this game in particular? I don't think so. I think we hit... I think a lot of it was the combat being so different, the skill thing just feeling different, and the fact that you craft, and how big... I mean, every Assassin's Creed game tries to boast bigger open world than the previous ones, which... With, you know, dubious sometimes, if I really think it's bigger than the previous one. But this one does feel like the biggest Assassin's Creed game. Almost to a fault. Yeah, there's there's too much open space at some points. There's too much. So, it feels like it feels like it's almost as big as Breath of the Wild, but there's some spaces they needed to fill in that didn't have stuff in it. Yeah, especially the deserty part. Well, see, Breath of the Wild, like, I don't... Mm. I don't want to make this comparison because it'll get ugly real fast. Breath of the Wild, everything felt so deliberate. Like, it felt like everything was there, if not for a reason of being interesting to go to, but it rounded out the world. There's like 10 square kilometers of desert in this game. Yeah. It does nothing. I mean, don't get me wrong. When I saw the Giza part with all the pyramids, I was like, I want to go over there and explore that. And I have since terribly rated the tombs of every Egyptian pharaoh. <laughs> well, not everyone, because you haven't figured out the mirror puzzle yet, yeah. which you did. Yeah. You just didn't know you did. <laughs> the best. Anyways, so this, the idea of the games changing their gameplay as the series progressed made us think, what other games have done similar things? And Brent, would you like to segue on to the next series that was most obvious um, for doing it twice? Resident Evil. So we're only sticking with the mainline series because when I pitched this idea to a few other people, like, well, what about the real shooter? And what about the first person yeah. shooter? And what about, no, we're sticking through one through seven. Yeah. Anyways, so Brent, why don't you go into the 
first major time that this changed. So I would say three to four, but Code Veronica is still like the main. So in between those from the top corner-esque bad camera angles for horror effect where you don't always see what's coming at you, stagnant cameras to the third person shooter-esque of Resident Evil 4. And that was, it was actually for, I'm gonna, the game Resident Evil 4 was critically lauded. People loved it. Even though I don't think you've played it yet. I've not. Well, yeah, I've played the beginning of it. I think you watched me play through the whole game one weekend. I watched you play some of it, not all oh, of it. Oh, you watched me play the um, Mission Aya thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I watched you play. But yeah, it was just a drastic change from the slow combat pace of the original several Resident Evil games to to the uh, just the faster paced action that was Resident Evil 4. And it was definitely more action pay- packed. But you had to have seen some of the tension that was involved in Resident Evil 4. Yeah, I mean, the spike guys, yes, I, I get that. Well, not just the spike guys, but the first level alone, the village fight. Oh, yeah, because I actually have played that. So the so village yeah. fight. And then later, when you're fighting this monster, in a, you didn't get far enough to see the cage fight. But you... No, I... I yeah, haven't. you have to elude this monster, and there are times when you have to just straight up be stealthy. There is a monster called the Verdugo. It is basically the Verdugo is basically the right hand man of one of the major antagonists. You cannot shoot it with guns. The only way you can hurt it, kill it, is if you freeze it when it's coming at you. And then you have to explode it with a rocket launcher. Only way you can kill this thing in the game. While thinking about this, there is one that we can give honorable mention to for not being a drastic change, but at least an attempt at a small change. Resident Evil Zero, even if the game isn't the Forget best one. Forget that game. But no. it did. It did. <laughs> it did try to employ the use of two different characters to do puzzles, which was an interesting attempt. And, even if the game is gar, uh, even if the game and story game are garbage, I thought, the, on that I thought the idea of using two different characters in comparison to the other one was an interesting way to do. Yeah, puzzles. well, it wasn't good. Sorry, I, I said it was just an attempt. I didn't say uh, it was good. God, forget that game. But um, uh, from Resident Evil Four to Resident Evil Six, also the games progressively got more action. actiony. Yeah, there's uh, no Re- two ways about it. Uh, Resident Evil Five alone, the game goes from horror to straight full up on, action. Yeah. By like, the time you're fighting zombies with machine guns at the end of the game. About two thirds of the way through, they just throw it entirely, entirely to the wind. And they're like, all right, these these zombies wear berets and have uh, automatic <laughs> weapons. Here comes the guy with the with the uh, Gatling gun. Get down. Oh, my God. Uh, I still it, loved it, RE5. And it did have some decent horror moments like the um, what was his name? The big guy. With the giant hammer axe thing. I just knew him as the executioner. Is that the executioner? Yeah, but there was all... See, that's where it wasn't as effective as the first game. Was because Dr. Salvador, the chainsaw Chainsaw guy. guy. There you go. Like, he was a persistent threat. And he was always crazy scary. Because this game, for as violent as the Resident Evil series can be, RE4 took the cake. Like, you got... Mm -hmm. Oh my god. In RE4, you could take hits from zombies. So a buddy of mine, he was playing RE4, and the chainsaw guy was coming at him, and he had his uh, shotgun equipped. He's like, I'll just take the hit because I've taken these hits a thousand times. With the chainsaw guy, if he hits you, you are instantly killed. And to add a little more flair to it, if you have the shotgun equipped, you will hold it up to try to keep the shotgun from... Uh, attacking you and he will cut through it and cut into your neck that's where I thought RE5 was really starting to lose it was the chainsaw guy didn't it wasn't that graphic okay yeah Uh, another thing I would say progressively the fact that 5 also pseudo introduced uh, the use of uh, co-op well and that's kind of where I disagree so RE5 did it great for couch co-op yeah 
but it did it so poorly for individual. Yeah, I know that one. I know that one very well. That in RE6, it made your character an indestructible uh, demigod, which you never wanted to play cooperatively. So it it wasn't... It, uh, I was very disappointed by that progress. But, but... That... Does that segue to that the next change? That segues great until the next change, which you talk about what the new format was, and then I'll fill in the big gaps because I know... I mean, we went from a third-person action shooter to going back to horror, but in the first-person perspective, taking cues from a lot of the indie games that have been first-person horror games of recent. Now, I know that you are not a fan of Honest Trailers, for the most part, because you think they're a little sassy for your taste and they're a little cynical. But I do have to agree. First off, you watched me play about the first two thirds of that game. So you got far enough to see what I'm referring to. What they said is experience the most tense Resident Evil game you have played in years with legitimate fear until you get the ch- until you get the shotgun. <laughs> Now, you saw me play the game in New Game Plus with the circular saw. Yeah. So there was zero tension at any point. But, spoiler, I guess, even though we've mentioned it on here before, um, can you imagine how much I freaked out the first time I did that? This is huge spoilers. Please skip ahead if you're going to play this game. Can you imagine how intense that garage fight was for me the oh, first yeah. time? Oh, no, I can only oh imagine. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was he does insane. not go down. He doesn't go down. He gets in the car if you don't stop him fast enough. It's insane. That garage fight is a hallmark of what made that game so good. The pacing, for the most part, was great. It fell apart a little bit at the end, but I, for the most part... It got away from the silly over the top mess. Supposedly, the Resident Evil Revelations games kind of explain what happened with Umbrella in between 5, 6, and now. No lava, Wesker? Uh, supposedly, he's legit dead. Aww. But I want a crab monster. Yeah, same here. I, I looked that up because um, I was curious, and apparently, word of God is he's dead. Ah, <sighs> that's disappointing. Anyways, so I'm unbelievably curious to see where the franchise goes because re7 was i'm gonna go ahead and say re7 was my favorite game favorite resident evil game i can see that and i loved four and i loved five and six was not good (laughs) i wanted it to be good so bad brent you did (laughs) So we are actually chewing up way more time with this than I thought. We got about 10 minutes left. Ooh, buddy. Right? So some other games that we had on here were games that changed as the series progressed. We had Sonic on here, Mario on here, Zelda on here, and Final Fantasy as an honorable mention. We're only going to mention Final Fantasy as an honorable mention because FF11 and FF14 were both MMORPGs. Now, you can debate whether or not you consider that to be a shift because it still has RPG in the title. It does. But you do have to have a distinctly different approach when you're interacting with other people. Depending on who you ask, myself being one of those, when you involve other people, it becomes insanely less fun. (laughs) I agree with that. Yeah. Especially, oh my God, there's a phrase, pickup groups. When you have to find random people to do these things with, you want to blow your brains out. But it's an attempt to, and here's the thing, with Assassin's Creed, that was a noted difference because the series needed to change. The series had stagnated. With Resident Evil, it was a noted change because similar reasons. Uh, RE3, they felt like they'd gone about as far as they could go. RE6, they felt about as far as they could go. Well, I think Veronica was probably, but, but yeah, yeah. This, it felt more like they needed, they felt the need to embrace the current market climate. So, FF11 was a Gen 1 MMO. Like, that came out back when EverQuest came out. So, and FF14, for better or worse, has embraced the new MMO. Now, the first version of it was the hottest of garbage. 
hottest of yeah, garbage. I remember you and you and Nick talking about that something. Oh, buddy. Now, the second version of that was dramatically improved. Um, where it stands now is a different matter of opinion. But anyways, so of the three series we discussed, is there anything you'd like to focus on the most? I feel like we can touch each of these in little bits and pieces, specifically with Sonic when it went to Sonic Adventure. Yeah, Adventure would be a definite huge change for the franchise because you're going from the 2D element, the side-scrolling 2D element, to a 3D 3D environment that you have to try. And I mean, it still had similar mechanics. Could you speed uh, Super Bowl in that? Uh, in Adventure? Adventure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ever since Sonic 2, they found some way to incorporate that. But... Uh, yeah, I mean, Adventure, you had to incorporate... I don't... I, I played two, and I know I've played one, but I can't remember everything on one. I, could you play as every character? Yes. Okay. Yes, that was integral to it. In fact, you couldn't actually get the final chapter until you beat everybody else's. Oh, okay. So, Tails and uh, Knuckles. Tails, Knuckles, the robot, Amy... Yeah. Oh, I guess in two, Shadow replaces the robot. Yes, because do you know why they actually made the robot originally? Uh uh-uh. Because they said, we get a lot of requests to have Sonic play with a gun. So this was so we could play Sonic with a gun. It was... <laughs> Sonic Adventure was very well received when it originally came out. It has not aged well. Yeah, I could say that. I could see it. And I want to defend it, and we've talked about Sonic games extensively on this podcast before. Not you and I, me and Nick. Oh, yeah. And I just, I'm not going to say anything about Sonic Adventure because the, when I played it on Dreamcast, I loved it. When I went back to replay it four years later, I didn't feel that same spark. So I just, I'm not going to say anything because I know what they were trying to do. They were trying to expand the different gameplay styles of Sonic available to it. Whether or not that was successful is up to the viewer to decide and how they chose to continue using it is also debatable, but they definitely made a change in order to try and keep the series fresh. And... Hit Mario? I kind of want to do Zelda. No, we just did the big big multi-part Zelda, so we'll do the Mario. So what do you think was the big Mario shift? Well, I would say this st- still the same thing moving from 2D to 3D, definitely. So, there are, you know, there's so many little increments that you could make the case for. For example, Super Mario World. Yeah, you could okay. Play, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, plus the, op- well, I was going to say the open world map, but that was also in Super Mario Brothers 3, so... Yeah, well, there was the open world map in Super Mario Brothers 3, but you couldn't go back and redo levels unless you died. Oh, yeah. They included secrets that you had to unlock to get to different worlds. Like Now, what, that's not a change in the gameplay, though. It's not. It's not. It's um, a change to how you approach the same gameplay. So I would go with 3D. I'm sorry for throwing a monkey wrench into that. But now it wasn't just because it was 3D. It's because you were given a set of objectives in each level. In Super Mario 3D, you were given, like, there's... What, eight or ten stars? Eight, eight I stars. I think it's eight at most per... Eight in most worlds. And they said, get them however you want. Whatever order you want. And that's where I thought... Um, yeah, and some of them wouldn't even... Because it wouldn't show up on the screen, some of them, until you beat the one ahead of it. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you could just get the star by just doing the thing, and then it would automatically show you the rest of the stars. Yeah. Um, like... I can't even, the first one is what get to the top, you know, the, in bomb. Uh, yeah, King bomb Yeah, get to the very top of the thing and fight him, but you could get the choppy to bust open the gate and get that star. Did you call it the choppy? Yeah, I did. Awesome. <laughs> I respect it. Anyways. Uh, to bust open that gate, the grate, and get that star from in was there. Was it a great grate? Yes. Okay. It was a really big grate. It was... It was a great, great. Anyways. <laughs> or you, uh, I was, well, there's one you can't do because you have to beat the first star to get the red, uh, Balaam to open up the cannons for you. Right. So, so you can't it, do all of them out of order. You can't do all of them out of order. This is a valid point. But this, 
gave rise to a just different experience of Mario. And they did they did continue to do and you didn't have to do every world. You didn't have to do every world, which wasn't it well, not really new. You could skip worlds. Skip worlds the on first the other one, one. Yeah, but yeah, but not like you just didn't have to do them. You didn't have to skip them. You could just go to the ones you felt easier. You felt at more. At, you felt more at ease doing than ones that you had difficulty at. Mm-hmm. Like I hated the water levels. Now I did them when I 100 percent of the game, but you gotta keep bringing that one up, I don't did. you? That's a problem for me. Yeah. So. That was them just trying to continue to push the mold and see what they could accomplish. So I think that they they did well in that regard. So anyways, we are about wrapped up. You cool just wrapping this? Yeah, sure. Okay. So Brent, thank you for coming on. You. Let us know if you thought that there were any games that you got into late and it was something that was really instrumental to you, or let us know if we missed some significant games that changed as the series went on, things that were a major shift that really affected the game series for better or worse. Let us know your opinions, but until next time, my name is Josh, and this is Co-Opinions. Co-opinions.